first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me here. And uh, we drove around. We like your nice little town. We, we've been to a lot of places, and we leave home early to explore. And we, we've been walking around this downtown to look around and stuff. And just uh, what we do is, can you imagine how this place looked like in 1956? Yeah, I do. You know, we do that to every town or 1945. It just depends what town is a different year. And we can well, look at this, how this would have looked. And we kind of reimagine how this town would have looked like. A lot like it does now. Okay. That's what she said. Probably about the same, you know. But that's that's our entertainment. I'm not from around here. I grew up in California. Well, first, uh, we left Texas when I was four years old. And we ended up in California. And that's where I was raised. And I went to college there. And my job took me to the south. And uh, I always wanted to leave California. I grew up in a small farm town, about this size. And I was really intrigued by reading these stories of, you know, our Fresno Bee, a newspaper about the world stories, local, and then, you know, from, from other states. So all the Southern stuff really intrigued me. So when I had the chance, I left in 80, 1985 after school. And I never went back home. In fact, I've been more on the, my own out here than me visiting back home. I don't usually go home that often, only for important dates and you know funerals and stuff. But my, my mom passed a couple years ago. My dad's still out there. Uh, my brother ended up in California, Texas after the after serving in the military service, Air Force. He stayed. He went back to Lackland Air Force Base. He's still there. My other brother's still there with my with my dad. And my sister is out in Monterey, so I'm the furthest out. Uh, but I like it out here. Changed changed me. Changed my daughters. You know they're on. No, I have no regrets, but I'm going to start this off. Um, again, my name is Richard Luna Garcia. I'm a third generation Mexican American. I'm a second lieutenant commander of the Tennessee Division SCV. I'm the camp commander of the Gainsborough Invincibles, Camp 1685, and I'm a, a reenactor with the 38th Mississippi Infantry. My direct ancestors come from South Texas, primarily Crystal City, Maverick, Eagle Pass, San Antonio, in other cities within Zavala, Maverick, and Bexar counties, bordering Coahuila, Mexico. Thank you for this, for this opportunity to present Blood on the, blood on the Rio Grande. A Tejano is a Texan of Mexican ancestry. A Hispanic is an American term to describe any resident of the United States of any racial background, of any country, and of any religion who has at least one ancestor from the people of Spain, Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Central and South America. A vaquero is a Spanish word for cowboy, horseman, or cavalryman. And a unionista is a union sympathizer or union soldier. Reflect back today to, the, to the day of Fort Sumner where some of your ancestors were present. Visualize with me as I share a quote from Vaqueros of Blue and Gray by Jerry D. Thompson on what was happening during, during the same time frame with my ancestors in South Texas. On the same day Fort Sumner fell to the Confederate forces in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, a mutiny against the Lone Star State erupted deep in the heart of South Texas brush country. In May 1861, more than a month later, on the same day the citizens of Virginia voted in favor of secession, the Zapata County revolt into a bloody battle with a 37-year-old Confederate captain from Laredo, Texas, leading his Confederates to victory. In February 1862, one day, before the Confederate President Jefferson Davis was sworn in in pouring rain at Richmond, Virginia, Union Confederate forces clashed in the Rio Grande Valley in far off New Mexico. In March 1864, nine days after General Ulysses S. Grant was commissioned Lieutenant General and given command of the armies of the United States, the Confederate commander from Laredo courageously defeated a Union force to attempt to seize control of Laredo and cut to Texas cotton trade. In early May 1865, one month after Abraham Lincoln fell to an assassin's bullet at Forest Theater in Washington, Union Confederate forces clashed in the lower Rio Grande Valley. After a bloody battle, the Confederates were victorious. That Confederate leader was Colonel Jose de los Santos Benavides. Texas declared its secession for the United States of America on February 1, 1861. Joined the Confederate States on March 2, 1861, after replaced its governor. Sam Houston when he refused to take the oath of allegiance to the Confederacy. The New Orleans-born Lieutenant Governor Edward Clark was then sworn in as Confederate Governor of Texas. After Texas passed the Ordinance of Secession, the state government appointed four men as commissioners 
of public safety to negotiate with the federal government for the safe transfer of military installations and bases in Texas to the Confederates. Those men were Land Baron Sam A. Maverick, Thomas J. Devine, a San Antonio attorney, and Dr. Philip N. Luckett, who attended West Point and became Quartermaster General. Former U.S. Army General David Twiggs, a Georgia native, was also on the commission. They met on February 8, 1861, to arrange to surrender federal property in San Antonio, including the military stores being housed in the Old Alamo Mission. As a result of the negotiations, and to avoid a bloody confrontation on the streets of San Antonio, Twiggs delivered his entire command and army property worth $1.3 million to the Confederacy, an act that brought cries of treason from the Union throughout the state. Almost immediately, Twiggs was dismissed from the U.S. Army by President Buchanan for treachery to the flag of his country. Shortly afterwards, he accepted a commission as general in the Confederate Army, but was so upset by being branded a traitor, he wrote a letter to Buchanan stating the intention to call up upon him for a personal interview, which, which meant, back then, I want to fight a deal with you. Future Confederate leader Robert E. Lee, that is still a colonel in the U.S. Army and commandant of the Texas Military Department, was in San Antonio at the time, and when he heard the news of the surrender of Texas authorities, he responded, has it come so soon as this? In Texas, this was a war within a war, Texan versus Texan, Mexican versus Mexican. Over 70,000 sons of Texas served in the Confederate Army, and Texas regiments fought and made in every major battle throughout the war. The state furnished the Confederacy with 45 regiments of cavalry, 23 regiments of infantry, 12 battalions of cavalry, 4 battalions of infantry, 5 regiments of heavy artillery, and 30 batteries of light artillery. The state maintained its own expense of additional state troops that for home defense against formidable Indian hostiles. The Comanche, the Apache, the Tonkawa, and the Kiowa tribes that raided through South Texas across the Rio Grande from northern Mexico. No greater tribute was ever paid to the Texas fighting man than the one that came from Robert E. Lee. Never mind the raggedness, they said with a smile, the enemy never sees the backs of my Texans. It has been estimated there were 13,000 Hispanics that served in the ranks of the Confederacy. They were served as officers, ship captains, sailors, clergy, cavalry, infantry, artillery, marines, physicians, and blockade runners. Of those 13,000, 3,000 Texan Mexicans were in the Confederacy. The Mexicans who fought for the Confederacy outnumbered Mexicans who fought for the Unionistas by a ratio of 3 to 1. Many Tejanos who enlisted in the Confederate Army saw combat far from home. A few who joined John Bell Hood's Texas Brigade fought in the battles of Seven Pines, Chickamauga, Cold Harbor, Gaines Mill, Manassas, Sharpsburg, Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, and the Wilderness in Appomattox Courthouse. In addition, other towns from San Antonio served in General Hiram Granberry's Brigade, the 6th Texas Infantry, also known as the Alamo Rifles, and fought in several Eastern campaigns. Chattanooga, Chickamauga, Atlanta, and Franklin. Tejanos who enlisted from San Antonio, Eagle Pass, and the Fort Clark area joined John R. Baylor's 2nd Texas Mountain Rifles. They marched across the deserts of West Texas to secure the Mazilla Valley and New Mexico Territory. This battle resulted in Confederate victory, establishing Tucson as the capital of the Western District of Confederate Arizona Territory. Fifty miles northwest of Tucson, the Battle of Pachalco Peak was the westernmost battle of the war between the states. The Honolulu were military units when Jefferson Davis appointed General Henry Hopkins Silby's Confederate Army of New Mexico to lead an expeditionary force from Texas to seize New Mexico territory and to seize the silver mines in Colorado territory. Their intent was to move into California to capture harbors, ports, and gold mines. This was the most ambitious attempt to establish control of the American West and open additional theater in the war. On the screen is an extensive list of all the units that Tejanos served under. Tejanos and these units quite possibly fought alongside your ancestors in the battles of Shiloh, Nashville, Franklin, Murfreesboro, Knoxville, and Chickamauga, and Atlanta. The artwork on the screen was done by Carl G. Von Iwanski. It was an early war sketch published in Harper's Weekly, and it depicts Tejano Confederate troops on Las Morris Creek near Fort Clark, Texas. If you look closely, the, the Tejanos are the dark-shaded ones, mixed in with Anglo soldiers. Do you see them now? 
one wearing a sombrero. From this sketch, general soldiers can be seen opening supply boxes taken from units covered stolen covered wagon. They're hauling wood, drawing water, smoking cigarettes, going to Havelina, and drinking Pat's favorite local whiskey. <laughs> Why did the house enlist in the war of Northern Aggression? The community and family obligations were as deep in town and culture. Many had grown up in the northern frontier of Mexico as proponents of Mexican federalism, which is the belief of original autonomy that coincided with the states' rights policies of the Confederacy. Others had engaged in frequent clashes with U.S. troops stationed on the border in the aftermath of the U.S.-Mexican War in 1846 to 1848, and welcomed the removal of these federal forces from the area. Many wealthy town ranchers married their Creole counterparts in Louisiana and were linked to the Confederate leaders of Texas by marriage, politics, and shared economic interests. They were poor and the money was needed, and to protect their families who were leaving the Rio Grande frontier from hostiles. The town was accustomed to civil unrest, revolution, volatile situations because they lived under five flags. The Republic of Mexico, the Republic of the Rio Grande, the Republic of Texas, the United States and the Confederacy. Most towns could, could not speak English. They were poor, illiterate, sometimes as high as 90 percent. Their average age was 28 years old, although there were many in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Most were Mexican-born and listed their birthplaces as Mir, Jalapa, Veracruz, Chihuahua, San Fernando, Monterrey, Guadalajara, San Luis, Potisi, Tampico, Puebla, Ciudad Victoria, and Coahuila. They became U.S. citizens at the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on February 2, 1848 occurred after the Mexican-American War and the next 525,000 square miles of Mexican land to the United States, which is present-day Texas, Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming. In addition, some towns were wealthy, land and slave owners, and highly educated. For example, Confederate Captain Jose Ana Navarro Jr. was born in San Antonio. He received a bachelor law degree from Harvard University and joined the 8th Texas Infantry. These officers went on to become leaders and sometimes, these men went, excuse me, these men went, went to become leaders and sometimes officers in the war. The Ana soldiers were famous for their horsemanship and preferred cavalry over infantry. They were acclimated to and knowledgeable of the desert terrain and most towns came from Webb, Bexar, or Refugio Counties, Texas. The yellow heel braid and the brass buttons of fancy cavalry uniforms were seldom seen on town horsemen. Sometimes the officers acquired uniforms trimmed with a braid, but the battle soldier seldom had fancy yellow striped cavalry pants. They wore southwestern style frontier clothing that was a diverse mixture of uniforms. Cavalrymen preferred the butternut colored clothing over the gray flannel material produced in the penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas. The butternut uniforms made from jean type fabric outlasted the flannel, especially in jackets and pants. Riding and marching through the prickly desert brush country ripped soft flannel cloth to shreds. The, arm, the army issued hats, but, but the lack of supplies left the choice up to the individual. Hats came in many types and colors, but most towns wore a wide brim hat of palm fiber, fur, felt, or cloth. Infantry and cavalry alike wore the westerners' wide brim hats, but the, but the volunteers from the San Antonio, the Lower and Nuestas River, and the Rio Grande frontier were partial to Mexican sombreros. Colors varied from brown to light gray and the suburb protected them from the intense Texas sun and the cold driving rain. If you notice, Tammy over there has some examples. That is a palm fiber hat. She's bringing them around. That's a palm fiber hat. Uh, oh, look at that. <laughs> Looks good with the dress, doesn't it? Yeah, the sombrero <laughs> is pretty much the same style, just different sizes and colors. My, that's my father's hat. It's over 60 years old. I've been trying to grab that hat for a long, long time. And he finally gave it up about three years ago. And when I called him, Dad, can I have it finally? And he goes, yes, when you come visit, it's yours. But I'm glad you called me because I was going to take them to the Mexican restaurant and trade it for dinner. <laughs> so I got, I got really, really lucky on that one. Yeah. Uh, that is a sugar loaf, wool, handmade, same as this. I just had a shape different. And it's called a sugar loaf because the crown is shaped like a loaf of sugar sold in Mexico. So they called it a sugar loaf. And that's a short brim sombrero, it's felt. It's more of a dressier style. 
So it goes with the, with a uh, uh, officer's uh, uniform. And a star. Yeah. Tehano Texas soldiers pinned these stars, which was a symbol of secession and uh, independence. This gave them a proud look. I mean, you put a star, you kind of, you know, kind of badass, right? You want a star? <laughs> okay. But this star was also popular with many of the other Confederate units, and especially the Mississippi guys. When I was up there doing a program, you know, I was dressed like this, and, and we did a reenactment there. The first thing is they said was, mother uniform, I have stars, my, Texas stars on my buttons. They go, I'm glad you're wearing Mississippi stars and Mississippi star on your hat. They claim that star is their own. And I've been to a lot of places in Mississippi, and that's the first thing they say. It's a Mississippi Park, Mississippi star. Texas stole the star. This is our star. <laughs> <laughs> that's their story in there. OK. But it hadn't changed Texas. No. <laughs> I'll, I'll, come, I'll, I'll come to that part later. I'll, I'll talk about that. Weapons, they packed a frontier man's arsenal. They had shotguns, swords, bowie knives, lances early war, captured from the Mexican-American War, Colt revolvers, carbines as well as infields, Mississippi and Sharps rifles. The photo on the screen depicts the charge of the 5th Texas Mounted Volunteers, who were armed with 9 foot long wooden lances, typical 12 inch long and 3 inch wide steel blades at the Battle of Alberti, New Mexico. From this, from this charge, it was obvious this was the first and the last lancer charge. They got hit pretty bad. These men were, furnished, were asked to furnish their own horses, two suits of winter clothing, a bowie knife, a double barrel shotgun, and a six shooter. In return, they would receive $150 a year for the man and $150 a year for his horse. I'm just thinking about that. That's an amazing amount of horses. Correct. Yeah. The muster cars provided the soldier's rank and his unit. It also contained his age, enlistment date, and other vital information. However, some town of muster rolls included a description of the soldier noting that they were small in stature, about around 5'1 or 5'2, and they were no one over the height of 5'8. These men were, not noted, were noted only not only for their age, but the color of their skin, the color of their hair, the thickness of the whiskers, and if the hair was thick, curly, or straight. Many of these men's names were misspelled because of language barriers. On the screen is my great-great-grandfather's muster cards. I have eight cards on them and they're all on the table back there. But these these uh, show that his muster date is 1862 in San Antonio by J.M. Penaloza, a town of captain, into the 8th Texas Infantry. It shows that he was 28 years old. It shows that his physical description is 5 foot 6 inches tall. He has gray eyes, dark hair, and was dark complected. And it also shows his birthplace and occupation. He was born in Mexico and he was a laborer. There were more than 300 Tejanos from refugio in Bexar counties that joined the 8th Texas Infantry. The 8th Texas Infantry Battalion of the Confederate States Army was organized by Alfred Marmaduke Hobby in Refugio County on May 14, 1862. It later became known as Hobby's 8th Texas Infantry Regiment. It contained one cavalry, four infantry, and five artillery companies. They served in the Trans-Mississippi Department. Two companies commanded by Captain Jose Penaloza and Captain Jose Angel Navarro were almost entirely Tejano and spoke only Spanish. Hobby's 8th Texas Regimental Flag, the flag bears St. Andrew's Cross, it has 12 stars on a red field representing Confederate States, it has one lone star in the middle representing Texas Independence and Secession. And I have a replica that I commissioned. This is how it will look in the field. Isn't that a good looking flag? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. Really pretty. As a battalion, the 8th Texas Infantry prevented a federal invasion at Corpus Christi. The battle occurred in 1862 while the coast of Texas was under blockade by the USS Arthur. Arthur's commander, Acting Lieutenant John Kitteridge, told Confederate Major Alfred M. Hobby that his orders were to inspect all U.S. government buildings and property. Hobby replied defiantly, and he told him, there are no such buildings in Corpus. He was not allowed the Federals to enter the city. A 40-hour truce was called to evacuate women and children. The 700 defenders of Corpus Christi were local volunteers in the four companies of the 8th Texas Infantry. Hobby had defied Kitteridge and let him know that Texans intended to resist. 
Defenders depended largely upon their only artillery pieces, three old smoothbore, smoothbore cannons, one 18-pounder, and two 12-pounders. However, these men neither had battle experience nor training in the use of artillery. Mm -hmm. When the 40-hour truce ended and no attack came, Harvey took advantage of the darkness to move his men and guns to earthworks. The move was accomplished without detection and brought the Texans within 400 yards of the steamer named Satchel. Early in the morning of August 16th, the Confederates began firing, striking the Union fleet. They hit the Satchel, the Carifas, the Reindeer, the Bellatalia, and the Breaker, all from New Orleans ports. Both sides exchanged fire for several hours before the Union withdrew. Another skirmish occurred a few days later and the Union withdrew again. Only one Confederate soldier was killed in the battle, despite the massive iron rainstorm fired at the battery and about the city. Hobby and one Union soldier were wounded, although not seriously. It was clearly a victory for the Texans and was acclaimed throughout the state as the Vicksburg of Texas. Returning residents found a number of spent shells and damaged homes, called them kitteridges, and they used them as doorstops. One curious find, according to local legend, was the presence of whiskey inside the spent shells. Apparently, Kittredge's remunctured Yankee crew had taken out the black powder and hid the whiskey <laughs> inside the shells. The 8th Texas Infantry... Huh? I said, they meant business. Yep. <laughs> the 8th Texas Infantry were then ordered to East Texas and fought in the Battle of Galveston. The Battle of Galveston was a naval and land battle when Confederate forces under Major John P. Magruder expelled occupying Union troops from the city of Galveston, Texas on January 1st, 1863. Some of Hobby's units were transferred to the Benavides Regiment, the 33rd Texas Cavalry, majority of the units under Thomas and Wall in the, in the battles of Mansfield and Pleasant Hill in the Red River Campaign in April 1864. The 8th Guard, Fort Esperanza, on Matorga Island, kept the battery on Mustang Island, and drove Union Naval Forces off St. Joseph Island. The regiment was mustered out of service on April 22, 1865. Colonel Jose de los Santos Benavides was born in Laredo on May, November 1st, 1823, to affluent parents named Jose Jesus and Margarita Ramon Benavides. Santos Benavides was the great great grandson of Tomas Sanchez de la Barro y Garza, the founder of Laredo. Benavides was a successful rancher and merchant. He was a mayor of Laredo and a Webb County judge. He was an Indian fighter and led several campaigns against the Apaches and other Native Americans. When Texas was under Mexican rule, Benavides was a strong backer of the Federalists during the decades long struggle with the Centrals in Mexico City. Isolated in, in a remote stretch near northern Mexico, he believed Laredo was best served by decentralized regional government. Because of his belief, it's not surprising Benavides was attracted to the states' rights doctrine of the Confederacy. After Texas succeeded in something he was instrumental in, Benavides was offered the position of Brigadier General with the Union Army. He then turned it down. He was also, then he was commissioned a captain in the Texas 33rd Cavalry, also called the Benavides Regiment, and assigned a task of patrol in the Rio Grande Valley, a job that he was highly suited for. Because of his ties to the region, Benavides maintained an effective network of spies, informants, and guerrillas, and scouts on both sides of the border. The Confederacy realized how important it was for them to have the support of Benavides and his regiment in the dark corner of the Confederacy. He and the town and population he represented were the Confederacy of the Rio Grande, as they were the sole defenders of the extreme southern flank of the Confederacy during 1863-1864. Benavides earned respect as a ruthless fighter for his guerrilla warfare tactics, and eventually became the highest ranking Mexican-American to serve in the Confederacy. He became colonel of the regiment and in the eyes of the Tejano community, he was known as the Tejano Tiger. His troops war cry, there was no rebel ale, but it was Viva Benavides and Viva la Confederacion. On the following screen are a couple of Benavides muster cards. Note in that remark section, it states, commanding the line of the Rio Grande. In March 1864, in the Battle of Laredo, Benavides repelled three heavy Union attacks and arranged for the safe passage of Texas white gold, cotton, across the Rio Grande into Metamoros and Baghdad, Mexico during the Union occupation of Brownsville. Benavides was sick in bed when the warned of the Union approach. Half dead from illness, he arose from his bed, gathered his troops, and told them, As it is, I have to fight to the last, though hardly able to stand, I shall die fighting. I won't retreat no matter what force the Yankees have. I know it can depend on my boys. 
Santos gave specific orders to his brother Cristobal in the event that he should be defeated. He said there are 5,000 bales of cotton in the plaza. It belongs to the Confederacy. If the day goes against us, burn it, fire it. Be sure to do the work properly, so not a bale of it shall fall into the hands of the Yankees. You will set my new house on fire, so nothing of mine shall pass the enemy. Let their victory be a barren one. Not only was he defending his hometown, but his quick action defended those 5,000 bales of Confederate cotton, stacked his barricades in the St. Augustine Plaza. He had been serving as snipers on adobe rooftops and men positioned in corrals, anticipating the attack. This unit consisted of, consisted of 42 town of soldiers fighting against the Texas, Texas Union Cavalry of two, 200 soldiers, which were 100 were Chihanos. Three times the Yankees charged. An eyewitness reported that Benavides and his men fought with the coolest bravery. The battle lasted about three hours. Benavides reported that the blue coats were repulsed by the vigorous fire of my gallant men. By nightfall, the Union forces retreated back into the Mesquite and there was no casualties on the Confederate side. Think about this. Research indicates that cotton was selling for about $100 a bale, which means this stockpile was worth $500,000 in their day. Wow. Inflation calculators reveal that $100 in the 1860s is equal, is equal to roughly around $3,000 by today's standards. This dash today would be worth $15 million. This cotton was the lifeblood of the Confederacy. Brownsville and Laredo were considered the back door of the Confederacy because they were the key ports for the export of southern cotton to Mexico. Town of Teamsters steered hundreds of wagon trains, ox carts, and mules into hard south Texas that contained cargoes of this white gold. They faced hunger, thirst, dust, and a threat of attack by hostiles, outlaws, and Union cavalry. This trip took six to eight weeks to complete. Texas is the only Confederate state with an international border. The cargo was carried to a pontoon bridge across the Rio Grande and loaded into Mexican and European flagship that could safely pass the Union ship blockade. This became crucial to obtain war supplies. Texas became the reigning cotton market in the world. As a result, the Confederate government created a cotton bureau and a bureau of foreign supplies within the Trans-Mississippi Department for the sole purpose of acquiring cotton to be exchanged for foreign supplies. By the end of the war, more than 320,000 bales of cotton was sent across the Rio Grande. In response, Lincoln sent over 6,000 Union troops to dismantle the Confederacy source of income. In Metamorphs and Baghdad, Mexico, Mexican merchants, speculators, and brokers purchased cotton that was bound for Mexican textile mills. The cotton was placed on vessels headed for foreign markets such as France, Havana, Dublin, and Liverpool. But also it was heading to U.S. ports such as Philadelphia, Boston, Providence, and New York. The, the cotton was going full circle from the south to Mexico, international, and going back up north. Through the heavy Union blockade, everything that could be used by the Confederate Army was brought into Texas from Mexico. The Confederates received needed war supplies, especially after the defeat of Vicksburg and when Texas became isolated from Richmond. They were received a variety of supplies such as infill rifles, percussion pack, percussion caps, black powder, food, tobacco, clothing, and medical supplies, and various dry goods. The Confederate government even received their engraving tools and materials for Confederate currency and documents to the Mexican border. <laughs> One manifest taken from the steamer named the Lovebird showed it carried 14,000 infill muskets, 5 million caps, and 2 million cartridges, and 156 revolvers. Another example, the steamer named the Willow Wisp had 46 kegs of powder and 89,000 percussion caps. Mexico was to the south, as what New York was to the more north. As you can see from the crowd and route map, the 3rd and Turkish Texas Cavalry protected over 700 square miles of scorched desert to deliver cotton to Mexico. No other field general or colonel commanded 700 square miles during the war. Benavidez's main enemy was a Mexican rancher, politician, and guerrilla named Juan Cortina. He was the owner of a large ranch in Brownsville, Texas. Cortina fought against the U.S. during the Mexican War. He boasted that he had a commission from Mexican President Benito Juarez and named Lincoln to fight against the Confederates. When federal forces invaded South Texas in 1863, Cortina sided with them and offered his services to Union General Nathaniel Banks. Cortina recruited outlaws, political refugees, and deserters from both sides of the border. The Union benefited from Cortina's raids as they forced a Confederate man in Texas 
to keep troops there versus sending them to do battle in the east. These men were paid in pieces of gold and given land in Texas for their services. In May 1861, Tiana Union residents in Zapata County revolted against Confederate authority. With Cortina's support, they marched in the village of Carrizo, Texas to execute Confederate officials and Confederate civilians. At Henry Reverend's ranch, outside the village, Benavides, Tiana Claret Calvary plowed into Cortina's men, routing them back into the Rio Grande. In a note to Confederate command, Benavides showed his ruthless side. He said, I particularly ordered my men not to arrest any of the bandits, but to call all that fell onto their hands. But if it is finally reported, consequently, I have no prisoners. As a reward, Edward Clark, the governor of Texas, presented him with a great pistol, and he wrote, I am happy to believe in your hands that it will always be used in defense of your country and prove an instrument of terror and destruction to her enemies. This led, this led on to an ongoing border conflict between the Confederate Benavides in Texas and Union supporting Cortina. It provoked Benavides not hesitate to, to pursue his enemies across the border and attack them. An example was Octaviano Zapata, a Mexican bandit who received U.S. consulate support from the inner peers to men of Morris, Mexico. Zapata boasted that he was promoted to the rank of colonel by Union authorities and that he was an emissary of the Lincoln government. After attacking Confederate supply trains and dis displaying the U.S. flag in the process, his war cry was, Que viva la Union, long live the Union. His raiding party was referred as the 1st Regiment of Union Troops in Texas. After the raids, he fled to Mexico where he thought he was safe. Benavides tracked him down, breaking a ratified agreement between the Mexican governments and the Confederacy about crossing the border. In 1863, near the, near the Mexican town of Mayor, Benavides surprised the Zapatista camp and brutally dispersed them all. All of the Pata's lieutenants were killed. Zapata fighting to the end had a skull bashed in with a rifle butt. Among Zapata's personal effects were found two letters stating he had been overwhelmed by the Confederates and forced to attach himself to the American Union. Benavides had little doubt that, he, that the letters implicated U.S. Consulate Leonard Pierce in the recruitment of Mexicans and the enlistment of Union sympathizers to form the nucleus of Texas Union Cavalry and the P. Banks Army of the Gulf. The regimental flag for, for Santos Calvary was the second national Confederate flag. After the war, he continued his mercantile and ranching endeavors. He remained active in politics, serving in the Texas legislature. He died as Loretta home in 1891. With 100 documented victorious battles, he was never defeated. He will be remembered as the highest rank in Tejano and the most respected military leader in Texas in the command of the Lion of the Rio Grande. But if his guarding presence was vital to the defense of Texas during the war. After the war progressed, he made federal invasion more daunting and more doubtful of success. Santos' brother, Cristobal Benavides, was a cattleman with a sizable ranch. He enlisted as a sergeant and was promoted to the rank of captain. He commanded a company of his brother's regiment, and he fought with his brother in Laredo. He served under Colonel John S. Ford in the 1864 Confederate Rio Grande expedition to, serve, to drive Unionist forces out to the lower Rio Grande Valley. Oldest brother, Refugio Benavides, also played an important role in his brothers in secession. And during the war on the border, Refugio was a captain in Texas 33rd Cavalry. Confederate Colonel John Ridd Ford said the Benavides family broke ground in favor of secession and did the Confederacy an immense favor by declaring for her. Jose Rafael de la Garza, my ancestor, town landowner, Confederate officer, Born in 1838 in San Antonio to Jose Antonio de la Garza and Maria Josefa Menchaca. His father was one of South Texas' most important landowners, who was the first in Texas to coin money and the first to use the famous Lone Star as an emblem. There's your, there's your answer. De la Garza was highly educated and left Texas in the 1850s to study Greek, Latin, and theology at St. Joseph's College in Barstown, Kentucky. He enlisted in the Confederate Army when the war erupted and served briefly on the Texas Mexico border under Santos Benavides. On March 31, 1862, in San Antonio, Garza, at the age of 23, was mustered into service as a second lieutenant and Captain Santos McAllister's Alamo Rifles. In 1863, he rose to a captain of Company K of the 6th Texas Infantry. Also served in the 70th Texas Cavalry, consolidated in French born General Camille Jules Marie Prince Polgat Polynax Brigade, stationed in Louisiana. During the Red River Campaign at the Battle of Mansfield on April 8, 1864, De La Garza led his company in a charge only to be hit above the knee with shell fragments. He led her death on the battlefield. 
also on the screen is, is some of De La Garza's mustard cards. On the screen is a post for a photo of Captain William Fears and then signed W.H. Parker of Company 8, 70th Texas Cavalry, Dismounted Cavalry. They are holding the battle flag of the regiment that was flown in the Battle of Mansfield. The hole in this flag is from a shell that struck the color guard in their advance in, the Ma in Mansfield. Possibly the same shell that mortally wounded De La Garza in his valiant charge. A collection of letters written by De La Garza and his brother-in-law, Mayo de Castillo Terry, have been compiled in a book called Tejanos in Gray, and I have a copy back there. It's a pretty cool, good book. It talks, it's kind of sad though, it, it talks, De La Garza writes letters home and nobody writes back. He's pleading for letters. So it's more, it's kind of depressing. There's, you know, camp life, battle life's in there. But his brother that's, that he's writing letters to as well, uh, Castillo, he talks about wife, uh, How's our cotton doing? Don't sell it to this guy. How much you're gonna get? You need to get this price. He was running his business farm during the war. So it was two, 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 two different letters, you know, businessman versus family man. On April 30th, De La Garza wrote, to his, wrote a letter to his mother and he said, up to now I don't think I would like a military career, but we'll see you later. Right now, I'm very comfortable sitting in my tent writing these few lines, but in a few days, who knows? These letters detail the daily social life of De La Garza, often including money to his relatives, and is pleased to receive mails from home. These letters represent a typical letter from a soldier, no matter, no matter the nationality yearning to be home. The last land battle of the Confederacy, the Battle of Palomino Ranch. On May 12th to 13th, 1865, the Battle of Palomino Ranch was the last battle between the Union and Confederate forces. This battle occurred one month after Robert Lee surrendered. The battle took place along the banks of the Rio Grande, just about 12 miles east of Brownsville, Texas. Confederate commander John Brent Ford had 300 men, had the Benavides Regiment, the Giddings Regiment, the Anderson Battalion. Union Colonel Theodore H. Barrett had 500 men, he had the 62nd U.S. Colored Troops, 2nd Texas Cavalry, which consisted of Tejanos, and the 34th Indiana Volunteers. The exact cause of the battle were unknown, and many theories have been proposed. Many believe, believe that Barrett, lacking any battle experience for the 62nd U.S. Colored Troops, desired a bit of battle glory before the end of the war. Others believe that Barrett needed horses for 300 dismounted cavalry soldiers. Whatever the cause, Barrett instructed Lieutenant Colonel David Branson to attack the Confederates. The Union invaders and the Confederates from Texas were aware of the surrender of the Confederate Eastern armies on April 9th. Santos Benavides Regiment and the other Confederates who remained were as resolute as their commanders to continue the war for Southern independence on Texas soil. The battle was considered a Confederate victory. There was little to no gain to the battle. Casualty accounts are unreliable and estimated about 30 deaths on each side, while about 100 Union forces were captured by the Confederates. It is thought that many of the Yankee deaths were caused by drowning in the Rio Grande. That's kind of odd. Why are you swimming in Mexico? You know, I mean, to either take a bullet hit or a shell hit or, or drown in, in the Rio Grande. They chose the river, I guess. Well, many of the deaths, and these guys were hit with artillery fire from Maximilian III, uh, Maximilian's troops on the, on the border because Maximilian was occupied at that time by France. Trans-Mississippi uh, General Kirby Smith formally surrendered to Texas on May 26, 1865. One month after General Robert Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant and Appomattox, the war ended for Santos Benavides, his two courageous brothers, and the Tejanos of Lone Star State. Tejanos had been one of the first to take up arms for the Confederacy and were among the last to surrender. Even in defeat, a sense of dignity, honor, and pride to bound these Tejanos soldiers. In the words of a SCV compatriot and author John Donald Rosales from the book called Hispanic Confederates, our ancestors were brave men and women who were not afraid or ashamed to fight for the proclaimed independence. We had no reason to let them look down from heaven and be ashamed of us for not preserving their memories, history, and Confederate symbols. These symbols must be kept clean from those who, in their absolute ignorance, racism, and segregationist hatred, deemed to use them to divide America and for other nefarious purposes and deeds. Their spirits linger here in every valley, in every glen, on every hill on every mountaintop, 
in every swamp, in every forest. They linger in places like Gettysburg and in the fields known but to them and God. Thus, let the battle flags fly, let the once again catch the wind, is least we can do for our valiant dead. Dio bendici, Dios bendiga Dixie, and que viva la confederacion, long live the confederacy. I want to thank Timothy for the PowerPoint. She is a member of Chapter 10 OCR, Order of Confederate Rose. She's also a member of Chapter 91, Murfreesboro, UDC. And thank you for letting me come to your beautiful town. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Any, any Quite a lot of research. Rich, tell a little bit about your ancestor. How you found out? Oh, yeah, about okay. your ancestor. Yes, uh, I found I found this history. Well, I wanted to join SCV, and we met a friend of our. We met Dottie Meadows, who was a friend of ours. She was at Lebanon State well, County Fair back then. It's a state fair now, and we're walking around, and there was a an, uh, Confederate encampment, and she was selling fundraiser. So we we're talking and come see us and i told her uh mexican descent she go well, mexican soldiers fought i know all the details but that camp the hatton camp will tell you so we went across the fairgrounds and we talked to him we'll come to our meeting and we'll talk some more so so that it happened it was that thursday so we went in there and i talked to the guys and they welcomed me and they told me what to do to start finding information so we kept searching um kind of a rudimentary work and uh, led us to a lot of Garcias, a whole bunch, from Louisiana, um, and a lot of, and a lot of uh, Rodriguez and Torreses, you know, but we realized that we have to have the actual document or proof that was connected to me. So Tamothy, uh, she was on, had a work trip to Washington, D.C., and she went to the Mormon Tabernacle, which had a... Yeah, they have everything. Yeah. <laughs> So we kept putting names and names and names, and we got a good, some good hits. They're really, really good hits. So we had these names. So I called my grandmother and asked her, you know, about the Civil War, and she's, she was 99 back then. She's still alive, 101. She'll be 102 next month. So I asked her, Grandma, she's speaking English, uh, do we have any soldados who mean soldiers in Spanish? And I gave her three words. Gris means gray. Azul means blue union. And uh, Verde means green, like modern soldier. And she goes, Mijo, which means my son, is Gadis. It was Confederate. So then I started giving the names that Thamothy had me. And we started listening to all her, 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 her grandfather and other relatives. And she said, I haven't heard those names in over 80 years. So when we were talking, at first she was... Me, I'm really tired. Just you know, I, you know. But when I started talking, mentioning these names, she lit up. She was really excited, and so she just started rallying all these stories up. And I go, Grandma, how come we didn't tell Dad? Because I, I told him, but, but I didn't want to share a lot of information because during those days back then, when I was a little girl, it was really rough. Tough was hard in the family. There was hardship. There was death. Uh, she said that her mother was stolen from bandits in Mexico. Never saw her again. So she goes to him, which I crossed the border. Uh, we were starting fresh in a new country. It was a new beginning for our family. So she never, she kept it all to herself. But I opened up another door. So it was good for me and good for our family because my dad, when I get home, he has a picture of, of a family tree. It's only three names. My grandmother and his father. And I think one other, that was it. He had the, the, the Garcia, the Torres, you know, her name. And it was just one, two, three. That was, that, in a frame. That, he was really proud of that. Mm -hmm. But now we have a whole list going back to the 1700s. You know, right. so that was a big, a big deal in our family's history. Um, mm -hmm. And my brothers are, are very are interested in one's an SCV member. My other brother wants to join, but his son's real liberal. So he's, he's afraid he's going to offend his son, his oldest son. So he doesn't join. But he's, he's really still interested in Confederate history. My sister's, you know, into it. So, uh, so it's really, it was been a good godsend. It sent me a new direction in my life, with the SCV. I, I feel that I'm compelled to tell the story because nobody tells the story. I'm the only one telling about this, is these guys. Um, I think it needs to be told because right now, in my opinion, um, what the world sees out there now is that the Southern states are all racist and all the people in the South are racist. There's no, there's no, there's no debate. It's automatic now. 
South, racist, oh, straight across. So I feel real compelled to tell this story that the Southern soldier was made up of different people, blacks, Native Americans, and Hispanics. They all contributed heavily uh, to the Southern cause and for Southern independence. So that's my way of giving back for bringing, for changing my life moving to the South.